wonderful speaker for tonight is uh, Tom Scheinfeld, who comes to us from UConn, uh, and where he is a professor of media. digital media. Yep. He's also an, an historian by training history of science. He did his PhD um, at, I don't know, in England, but I can't remember. Oxford. Yeah. Oxford. Um, and then I got to know Tom uh, when I was lucky enough to get a two-year postdoc at George Mason oh. University in Virginia, where Tom was the um, managing director of the Rose, uh, uh, Roy Rosenzweig Center for uh, Digital History. Uh, History and New Media. History and New Media. Yeah, got that one. Um, and he, well, I was there at this wonderful time when the tool Omeka was uh, in the process of being developed. And that was one of the projects that Tom <laughs> oversaw on the programming side of things. Uh, and uh, Mills Kelly and I uh, had one of the prototypes. Uh, so we had a grant to work on the history of 1989, uh, the revolutions in Eastern Europe, which had been now entered into testing on AP tests, but had not yet entered into the printed uh, textbooks that were available to high schools. So the project was to fill a gap online to provide teaching materials for those teachers until the textbooks got updated. It was kind of an NEH-sponsored thing. But as we were building the site, he and his team were building Omeka. And so it was actually a wonderful time to be there because you know, we would say, this doesn't work. And they'd say, well, we'll get it working. Or we need Omeka to be able to do this kind of thing, like search or create a, a basket to collect your documents. And, and they would you know, put it on their board. Um, and so it was a wonderful time to meet him. And now he's moved up to Yukon uh, and runs, well, he'll tell you us more, I think, about what he does down there, um, especially this new Greenhouse Studios that he does. Tom, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> well, it's nice to be back. I think I was here in 2009. It's hard, hard to believe that's almost 10 years ago now. Um, uh, but. Um, but it's a pleasure to be uh, back in UMass. I uh, grew up in Massachusetts, so it's um, I spent many nights here uh, with <laughs> friends um, during college. Um, so it is it is great to be here. Um, and thank you for coming. This talk was rescheduled from from the winter. Um, so I'm glad this is rain and not snow this time around. Right. Finally. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm very thrilled that I could be here before the end of the end of the semester. Um, I'm going to talk today about. Um, uh, collaborative creativity, of what art and design can teach humanists about working together. And um, this comes from experience that um, I've gained since I've uh, come to UConn. I, as John said, I'm, I was trained as a historian and I worked in a history department, a lab, the Center for History and New Media, connected to a history department for the first half or so of my career. And I, when I moved to UConn, I moved um, into uh, un sort of an unfamiliar position uh, in a uh, school of fine arts. Uh, I have my appointment is a joint appointment between the uh, Department of Digital Media and Design and the Department of History. So I have, so I arrived with two deans to, uh, and somehow I've managed now to get myself uh, involved with a third. I don't know um, what that says about me. Um, I guess I'm a glutton for punishment. Um, but. One of the things I learned when I entered into this new uh, School of Fine Arts is that a lot of the things that we had been working on in the digital humanities that we thought were so radical and so innovative were old hat, were just doing business uh, for artists. Um, and so uh, my talk uh, comes out of, of that experience. And one of those things that artists uh, have been doing for a long time um, that we are just uh, getting around to is collaboration. And so today I'm going to talk about some of the lessons learned uh, about collaboration from this new position I'm in and, um, and some of the ways we've tried to implement those lessons uh, in this new unit, this new, I guess you could call it a digital humanities center. Um, at UConn Greenhouse Studios. So collaboration. Collaboration has been a byword of digital scholarship very nearly since uh, the inception, right? Very nearly since 
uh, the inception of digital humanities, we have been talking about collaboration, and for good reason. Um, the complexity of producing digital works requires scholars to work closely with designers, and developers, and digital librarians, and editors, and, and others. Um, we often say that you know, sort of no one person has it in him or herself uh, to pull off a large-scale digital humanities project. So we are forced to collaborate in ways that we're maybe not forced to collaborate in traditional journal writing, uh, journal article writing, and, and monograph writing. But often, in fact, even in digital work, collaboration happens fairly late in the research and publication process. After the scholar, who has, usually it's a faculty member who has an idea for a project, after that scholar has completed the bulk of the research, uh, and well after the initial idea for the project. And digital humanists, and I've even given this advice myself, digital humanists are often advised to bring on collaborators only after they've exhausted their individual resources. Right? So I've often given advice where I've said to people, um, you know, dig into Omeka, do as much as you can, you know. Tr Try to stretch yourself as far as you can go. And when you can't go anymore, then start, you know, go to the library, get advice, reach out to, to the Digital Humanities Center, etc. And sometimes that's very good advice. But this way of working, this kind of what I would call late stage collaboration, um, also has its problems. And those problems have not gone unnoticed, especially by librarians. Librarians who are the ones who are commonly called upon to help out after projects are already well underway. Uh, the Digital Library Federation's Bethany Nowitzki, for example, has written frequently about the poor outcomes that can emerge when the relationship of librarians and other skilled practitioners, like developers, to digital scholarship is conceived of in terms of service as opposed to organic collaboration. And in fact, the collaborative trajectory, the outputs may be very different, but the collaborative trajectory from research to end product for digital scholarship is sometimes very remarkably similar to that of the collaborative trajectory for traditional works such as articles and books, where collaborators are brought on late in the work. For instance, you bring on an editor after the manuscript is basically done, right, in, in our work. And given the humanities' long configuration around text, right, it's no surprise that despite the changing technologies that many of the basic workflows uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the hierarchies that those workflows entail of our scholarly communications remain intact. John Mackenzie Owen has described a deeply rooted information change model of knowledge dissemination in which the chain of scholarship begins with an author, passes through a publisher, and culminates with access provided by libraries and use by readers. And he describes how communication between those actors, the author, the publisher, the library, and the reader, Communication between those actors only occurs at moments of handoff, at the moments when the work is handed off from one to another. And while the introduction of digital tools across this chain has altered the activities, right, the research and writing activities, and the preservation and reading activities of those various actors, it has not necessarily reconfigured the larger workflow in which those various actors remain interlinked but largely independent, save for those transactional handoff moments. Now, this transactional model has contributed to the persistence of what I view as an increasingly detrimental division of activities into those of knowledge creation and those of knowledge production. And I would say, and when I say creation, I mean the, the domain side, right? The historian, the who has the domain knowledge. And when I say production, I mean the build side, right? The developers, the, 
the, the designers who build the product, the librarians who build the product. And that this division between domain and build um, is more than just conceptual. Right? It's reflected in things like humanities workspaces, in funding, and in our interactions. The architecture, for instance, of humanities scholarship, departmental floors like this one, or buildings of long hallways with private offices, create spaces where the opportunities for collaboration are offered not really by the workspaces, but by the hallways. Right? The predominant model of funding the humanities, right, of funding humanities research, the fellowship is likewise conceived around the need for sequestered work. Right? The very purpose of a fellowship sort of, uh, is to remove the scholar from students and their faculty members for a year to be alone. So the funding model for the humanities is set up to eliminate the possibility of collaboration with one's own institutional colleagues for a certain amount of time. That's not always true. That's overstated. But you get my drift. And even when a humanities scholar is engaged in producing a work of digital or other non-traditional scholarship, this handoff habit is so well ingrained and the work of the build side is so well black boxed that many faculty remain isolated from developers, designers, editors, librarians, and other experts, even as they're making such key decisions as about things as the appropriate software packages and metadata schemas for their work. Those decisions are often made, I'm going to build an Omeka website, before the hum humanist has even spoken to a librarian, before the humanist has even talked to a developer. right? The metadata schemas that are in, in, in inherent in our spreadsheets are well decided before we talk to the people who are going to have to then take those metadata schemas and represent them in some kind of visualization online. And these issues presented by these old print focused workflows, right, as I said, are entwined with and exacerbated by frictions within academic labor hierarchy. The emphasis on traditional relationships and the naturalization of the domain build divide reify existing frameworks that give visibility to some kinds of academic labor while misrecognizing or discounting other kinds of academic labor. The most common form of this is the uneven power relationship between faculty and librarians, but it also exists, for example, within the library among cred credential librarians and non-credential librarians, between librarians and technical staff, between tenure track faculty and non-tenure track faculty, between editors and authors, and between faculty and students. Additionally, the supposing doing activities, right, the, don't, uh, the, the build side activities, the programming, the design, the database, development, the metadata management, the preservation and access activities are often cast as separate and subordinate to the thinking activities, research, analysis, synthesis, and writing. And even in the realm of digital scholarship, where collaborative undertakings are more the norm, there were many, many early and vigorous debates that pitted hack versus yak, practice versus theory, service versus scholarship, etc. And while digital humanists roundly acknowledge that those binaries structuring those conversations didn't present an accurate picture. Nevertheless, those binaries are useful in thinking about hierarchies that persist. And although digital humanists have recognized the corrosiveness of those binaries, a practical workflow to challenge and replace them is still yet lacking. Right? We still don't have good models, good workflows to subvert those binaries. So my new unit, Greenhouse Studios, is dedicated to addressing these persistent and intertwined problems of workflow and hierarchy. And we do that with a research mission that aims to value all stakeholders involved in producing scholarship, that flattens traditional academic hierarchies, and that systematizes the collaborative production and multimodal scholarship process by implementing what we call an inquiry-driven, collaboration-first model of scholarly production. A model that places continuous, 
close and equitable communication between all kinds of scholarly communications labor at the heart of its mission. All right, I'll say that again. Inquiry-driven collaboration first. Okay, I'm going to come back to that. Our model is an inquiry-driven collaboration first model. And our view is that all too often collaborators are brought on board to implement scholarly projects, not to imagine them. And at Greenhouse Studios, we aim to change this by pushing collaboration as well as uh, on traditional, and we do both traditional and digital scholarship, by pushing collaboration in humanity scholarship upstream in the research and publication process. Upstream to the very headwaters of inquiry, imagination, and project conception. This collaboration first approach, right? We start with collaboration at the very beginning of our process bring scholars together with designers, developers, editors, and librarians to start new projects, not merely, not merely to finish them. And it trusts in the emergent properties of the collaboration itself to produce new knowledge. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this process of ours. But first I wanna say a little bit of, about, sort of give a little bit of context uh, from, from my past work, sort of where this, this uh, idea comes from. This inquiry-driven collaboration first model has origins both in some past experience and in some new research. Um, I've been interested in emergent, what I call emergent approaches to scholarly communication for a, a long time, although I've only really come to think of them this way fairly recently. Uh, my first experiment in the emergent possibilities of radical collaboration took the form of that camp the Humanities and Technology Camp, an unconference that my colleagues at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media and I launched in 2008. We were thinking about how we, would, uh, how we could reduce the overhead of face-to-face -face scholarly communications, right? the overhead of putting on a conference. We wondered why academic conferences like the AHA or the ALA or the, or, um, the MLA um, had to be so expensive, right? Why did these meetings, why did this form of scholarly com communication have to be so expensive? And we were thinking surely in monetary terms, right? The enormous expense of like renting out a convention center and a conference hotel, and not just to the, to the, to the uh, scholarly association itself, but to like all, every university sending, you know, 30 faculty to San Diego for a week, you know, I just, the enormous expense of those meetings, right? So we were thinking about the, the monetary expense, but we were also thinking about the kind of structural and psychic ones, right? Like, think of the, the, the and, and, and maybe especially um, about the psychic ones, the kind of psychic angst that goes into those meetings, right? The stress involved, especially for people on the job market. And we were wondering how we could reduce that overhead, right? That kind of psychic overhead, that, um, that, that, that financial overhead, and figure out how we could reduce the scholarly meeting to sort of its most essential function, which is letting people talk to each other. Right, like, that, like that's what scholarly meetings are for, letting people talk to each other. So how could we reduce those costs? And we were involved um, in you know, sort of web development and software development. And so drawing on some models from Silicon Valley, um, we wondered if we could draw these costs down to the lowest possible level. So we thought about um, models like, that were emerging at the time, like Foo Camp and Bar Camp, unconferences that were being put on in Silicon Valley, where conference goers would find their own housing, where conference goers would set their own programs, where conference goers would establish their own goals for the meeting, right? Where there was no program committee, right? Where you brought a group of people together and you let them decide how to structure their interactions. You let a program emerge from the group rather than imposing a program on the group. And so we did, we put out a call, we said we were gonna have a meeting, a bunch of people came, um, and all we did was provide some space, we, like space like this, like space in our in our existing you know our existing space on the weekend when nobody was using it, 
provided some space, we provided some coffee, and we provided a few simple ground rules for how these interactions should be structured. Right? We almost gave them an algorithm for how to put on a meeting. And we set them to work. And from this simple set of rules emerged that camp, the Humanities and Technology Camp. Uh, at first, it was a single meeting in 2009. Uh, 2008, we put on another one in 2009. And in the summer of 2009, several of the attendees said to us, you know, I'd like to do something like this at my university. Could I? Could I do that? And we said, sure. Here, you know, here's the algorithm. Um, run it yourself. And so they did. Um, and a few more did in 2010. Um, and then uh, in 2000, late in 2010, we got a grant from the Mellon Foundation, um, a very small grant, uh, to basically put up a website where people could kind of aggregate their materials and put out their calls. And one after the other, these meetings were planned and staged spontaneously. Um, and 10 years later, there have been literally hundreds of that camps. Um, we haven't been funded. Our funding ran out in 2013, I believe. We haven't been funded for five years, and yet they still go on, right? With no central office, and no organization, and no funding, right? Other than, you know, funding from your dean to, to buy coffee, right? They're still running as a kind of self-sustaining community. And so that's where I got interested in this idea of emergence in scholarly knowledge production. And another example, so then, then we were thinking more about this and thinking, kind of interested in this model of self-organizing. Um, and so in, uh, in 2010, we applied for a grant uh, from the NEH for an Institute for Advanced Topics in Digital Humanities. Uh, and we brought together a diverse collection of scholars, students, programmers, designers, librarians, uh, etc., to conceive and build and launch an entirely new software tool for humanities scholarship in one week. Right? We called it One Week, One Tool. We put out a call. We said, send us an email if this sounds interesting to you. We're gonna, we're gonna pull up for one week we're going to have a hackathon. We're going to build a piece of software in one week. If this sounds cool to you, email us. We got about 75 emails back. We, all we asked for was an email from people saying, like, why does this sound interesting to you? Um, we chose 12 participants out of those 75 applicants. Um, we chose them for a couple, on a couple criteria, diversity. So diversity of, of um, position within the university, diversity of age, diversity of gender. We didn't get much race diversity. Um, diversity of skills. Um, but we didn't choose for particular skills or particular sort of lines on their CV. We chose mostly the people who were most enthusiastic about the idea. And we came up with a group of undergrads, graduate students, junior professors, adjunct professors, full faculty members, librarians, museum professionals, um, designers, developers, a range of people. And we began on the first day by brainstorming. Well, we sat, we actually began on the first day by sitting around with a beer and having everyone describe their superpower. Like, what are you best at? Right? What are you best at? We got to know one another, sat down later that day to brainstorm an idea for a tool to build, a piece of software to build. We decided by the middle of the second day what we were going to build, and we spent the last five days building that piece of software. And on the last day, we released it uh, to the world. Um, we did this in 2010. We released a product called Anthologize, which is a WordPress plugin designed to facilitate the remix and republication of blog posts as books. We did it again in 2013, and we released something called Serendipomatic, which was a specialized search engine, still running, both of them still running, still in use, um, designed to approximate for web users the experience of serendipitous discovery in physical archives. Right? And again, both of these are continue to be used. They're used by thousands of scholars and others around the world. And again, they prove the kind of 
energy and productivity and collaborative creativity that you can get when you put people together, strangers, in a room together in, with a, with a semi-structured progress and you let them self-organize around those simple rules. You can get amazing results. So with that background, um, that brings us up to about 2013. And with that, so with that background, I arrived uh, at UConn um, again, and I arrived in this school of fine arts with this joint appointment. Um, and my colleague Clarissa Seglio, who came with me from George Mason um, in 2013, uh, and I, we began to see the similarities of some of between some of the experimental humanities praxis we were piloting with One Week, One Tool in that camp, uh, and the arts methodologies employed by our new colleagues uh, working in such areas of artistic production as theater and interactive media and industrial design. And subsequent research into the literature of th especially theater production and industrial design and the emerging literature uh, uh, around design thinking led us to situate this prior work within some more well-established and well-studied paradigms within those fields. For example, especially uh, within the paradigm of, the, of design thinking as articulated by the Stanford D School and the Bay Area Consultancy IDEO. And IDEO advocates what they call a notion of human-centered design, where a product's user and his or her needs and cares are the kind of constant touchstone for the design process. And IDEO's process involves considerable time empathi empathizing with a user community. Tim Brown, one of the architects of this design thinking methodology, for example, <coughs> tells a story about the firm's work with Schwinn bicycles. And they were working with Schwinn bicycles that, and Schwinn was not selling as many bikes as they previously had. And they were wondering, why, why aren't anybody buying bikes anymore? And in the past, their strategy had been to keep making their bikes fancier and fancier and fancier with more elaborate components and you know, lighter weight materials and you know, sort of making them you know, higher and higher tech. And IDEO then sort of brought the salespeople from Schwinn, they brought the, design, the, the industrial designers from Schwinn, they brought um, the, the, the management of the company, and together with a bunch of the users. And they sat them down and ran them through uh, a, a process. Um, and what they learned was that the reason people weren't buying bicycles anymore was not because the bicycles, because they, 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 did, they you know, didn't have something that these people wanted. They realized that the bikes were too complicated, right? They realized that like, like the, the users were telling them like, Riding bikes isn't fun anymore. I have to get these lycra shorts, and I, you know, I have to. I have this fancy helmet, and it's got all these gears, and I don't know what to do with. When I was a kid, I loved riding bikes, right? Like I just got on my bike and I ra rode around. And from that process, Schwinn developed the cruiser bicycle, which you now see all over the place, right? It has basically no gears. It's got a big cushy seat. It's got big handlebars. You don't have to lean over in a crouch to to use. Right? And it was this process of bringing together all of the people involved in that production chain together at the beginning that allowed them to see the problem in their marketplace. Now, there are some limitations uh, to industry approaches when it comes to translating, as, we, as we've seen in the neoliberal university, um, translating some of those corporate approaches uh, to the academic context. And in the kind of facile way that they're adopted, uh, that corporate approaches are adopted um, by academic administrators, including in places like fine arts and engineering. So we took some of that reading into these industry approaches, and we set out with a, with a Mellon planning grant um, on uh, a year of, of research um, with other digital humanities centers around the country, um, going, to, going to university engineering departments, going to community maker spaces, 
um, going to library-based digital scholarship units, going to university presses, um, to talk about their design approaches and the challenges they were facing. To talk about some of the new things they were piloting, some of the things that had worked and didn't work. We also undertook, um, with some colleagues from the Ed School, uh, what they called a mental modeling process amongst our colleagues at UConn. So we got a, you know, some, some faculty member researchers, we got some librarians, we got some web designers, we got some, um, we got some uh, uh, outreach and marketing people. We got sort of the range of people that are involved in producing um, the scholarship that we do and we sat them down and we had them explain to us their creative process right the things they do to take a project whatever project means for them right maybe a monograph maybe it's if you're a if you're a scientist it's an experiment maybe if you're a librarian it's a it's a, 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 a new a new service launch or whatever it is you take a prod whatever project means to you and we had them arc out their mental model of how something goes from start to finish. Right? We did that for um, probably a dozen different kind of archetypes uh, within the university. And we then took that data and we kind of mapped it out. And we tried to find points of sympathy uh, between these mental models. Where did the models overlap? Where did they differ? Right? And one of the things we found was that the creative process that's undertaken by just about everybody is remarkably similar. It's just that it happens at different times and we use different language to talk about it, right? So what we found was oftentimes you would have, let's say a faculty member who would start a creative process and would be a third of the way into the creative process before he reached out to an archivist. Now the archivist who comes into that project to help out starts her creative process way back at the beginning, right? Has to kind of back up all the way to where the faculty member started and come up to speed and then start working with the faculty member. And that's true with developers and designers. It's true um, we saw across that people were having to start these cycles within cycles and back up to where whoever was before them in the information chain uh, where they had already got. So that was one thing we found. We also found that people talked about their work in very different ways. So a faculty member might call their a stage of their work, the research stage, right? The activity that happens in the research stage happens for most of, peop most of the people we interview, right? They all do some kind of research in their creative process. But a designer might call it inspiration gathering, right? A developer might call it um, uh, 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 environmental survey, right? They call it different things, but it really is the same activity. But the problem is those terms are not neutral terms, right? Those are loaded terms, right? Research sounds important. Inspiration gathering sounds kind of silly. So the terms by which people talk about their work are different. But the, the essential activities are often very much the same. So we try to find these points of harmony in the mental models. We tried to come up with language that was neutral, or more neutral, or at least different for everybody. Right? We tried to give a third set of terms for people to use when we were coming up with our design process. Because what we aimed to do ultimately was take the kind of dynamic that happens at that camp and take the kind of dynamic that happens in one week, one tool and to institutionalize it within the center, right? To create a space for that kind of emergent knowledge making 
to happen. And that's where we came up with our greenhouse studios design process. So out of all that research emerged this. So what we do at Greenhouse Studios is we start with a group of people. We bring six or eight diverse people from across the university, a mix of people who work for the library, people who work in the arts, people who work in the humanities, people who are staff, people who are faculty, people who are students, people who have technical skills, people who have domain area skills, right? A range of people, and each team is composed differently, right? We take six or eight people with diverse skills and who are eager to, to work together, to work on something. And we give them a prompt, right? We give them an external prompt. It's like an essay prompt that you might give to undergraduates, right? And it's important that we do that because none of the people in the group own that prompt. The prompt comes from the outside. Right? It's not a faculty member coming into the process with, this is my research and I need help doing it. You come help me. This is something that comes from the outside. So those faculty members have to be game. Right? Like, they have to be willing to do something that's like not necessarily clear for their research and career trajectory. Right? So we get a group of people, we drop an inquiry prompt in it. And it is a big kind of open-ended roomy kind of prompt. We have one uh, that we're, we're doing now called indigeneity, right? And it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of the thing you get at a conference, right? Where they say like, the theme for this year's, you know, MLA, you know, annual meeting is intersectionality, you know? And then they have a little paragraph about it and you're supposed to kind of like, you know, write your proposal to kind of sort of, basically you're taking your research and wedging it into that, into that prompt. But, but, but that's what we give them. And we give it to them as a starting point. They may not even end up doing anything on indigeneity. Their work can go wherever their work goes. But it's a place for them to start their discussions. So we bring them together and we introduce them to one another over a meal. Um, we draft a collaborative charter where we, everybody lays out on the table kind of what their expectations are, what they need from this, how they want to be treated, right? We write a, what we call our collaborative charter. And we launch into a series of sprints. Sprints are um, like two day long meetings that are separated by four or five weeks of, of downtime. Well, of not, uh, it's not downtime, it's actually homework. Um, but these two, two to one, two, three day long meetings um, and the first one we call understand. In the understand phase, um, what we do is we encourage people to understand who they are, right? What are the skills that the people bring to the table? What are the expectations that they bring? What do they need to get out of this process? Right? And to understand the prompt, right? What do they understand <coughs> indigeneity or whatever it is to mean? And we bring them through a structured process of understanding these things. From there, they produce their project brief. Their project brief is still, we're not even talking about what it is we're going to build yet. Right? We don't even know what we're doing yet. But the project brief lays out those understandings. How we as a group understand this prompt. How we as a group understand our resources and constraints. What resources do we bring to the project and what constraints do we operate under? From there, we enter into the identify phase, where we start to identify the kinds of things we might want to do together. Right? So we go through a process of, of thinking through, you know, what is our subject area of focus? What is our, um, what can we build together? What are the things that are possible? What are the things that are not possible? What are the things that are viable? that can be out there in the world and sort of count as scholarship within the academy? Um, what are the things that are desirable, both desirable to us and desirable to other audiences? Right? And what are we capable of as a team? From there, we put together a creative brief, which describes the, now it's just here. 
that we describe the kind of halfway through the process that we describe the like what media format it's going to take where we describe like it's going to be a website or it's going to be a performance or it's going to be an exhibition or it's going to be a app or it's going to be whatever it's going to be and it could take it could be an edited volume right it could take any form up until that point it's for the group to decide what it is they think with their talents and their resources that they can build together what intervention they can make that will make sense for them and they do this together from there we go into about a nine month to year long build phase where we do sort of iterative development on the on the work so if it's an edited volume you know it's a series of drafts if it's um, if it's a, a, a website it's we build out from a, a kind of minimum viable product to uh, to a, a larger website. It's that point. The building phase is also when the research happens, right? Because you know, writing and research is also doing, right? It's not just it's not preliminary. It's part of the work. So the so the research, you know, the content research is going on at the same time that the that the uh, the, the technology development or the or the, the we're developing the, the modes of communication. From there, uh, we produce a media manuscript and it goes out for peer review. Now that will look different depending on what kind of thing it is we're building, but, um, but it goes out for some kind of peer review. And from there, it's revised uh, and released to a, an audience where it's then um, disseminated and assessed. So, we launched this thing about a year and a half ago. Um, it's our new space. Um, as an interdisciplinary and interdepartmental <coughs> unit at UConn, it is shared by the School of Fine Arts, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and the library. We have a steering committee, and there's three members from each of those units on our, on our steering committee. Um, we have uh, started our first uh, group of projects. Um, our first cohort, Cohort A, which started in 20, those projects launched, or they, they initiated their design process in 2017. Um, uh, there were three of those. Um, those three uh, uh, projects are, one was, is a, the, the team um, decided to do a uh, set of short documentary films um, and a photo exhibit on um, uh, the topic of Fino, which is, um, in, in, in uh, I was not on this team, so I'm going to get this all wrong, but this concept of Fino is it exists in transnational Cuban communities. So what does Fino, which means kind of refinement or fanciness, as far as I don't know Spanish, but um, what does it mean for Cubans in Havana, and what does it mean for the Cuban diaspora uh, in, in Miami? That was one of the projects, and that one is mostly complete. Um, those some of those films have been submitted for film festivals. One was accepted. We're about we're about to hear. Um, we're about to be able to announce that. Um, so that was the outcome of that. Second project uh, was the uh, the team was responding to a collections based prompt. So the prompt could be a topic like indigeneity, or it could be a collection. And we have a collection in our archives of. Uh, the works of Ellen Emmett Rand, who was an early 20th century uh, portraitist, who um, she, an entrepreneur, she um, painted mainly uh, powerful men in New York, so the CEOs of like banks and big companies and politicians like, like the Roosevelts. Um, and she's been kind of forgotten. Um, and what the team has decided to do is they're um, right, again, based on the skills that were at the table, right? We've got an illustrator on this team. So they're doing a, a graphic novel um, about the choices she had to make as a woman and a mother and a, and a, and a, and a, and a wife with kind of a deadbeat husband and a, um, and a businesswoman um, who kind of was in this awkward position of spending lots of time alone in closed room with powerful men. Um, the choices she had to make um, in her in her business career um, and the things she didn't choose and comparing her to other artists of the period who made different choices and went in a different direction. So it's a, that, that's, uh, that's still in the works. It should be, I would think, I'm hoping by the end of the year. These process, this process is supposed to take two years from beginning to end. 
Um, so we're trying to scale also, scale up the production of digital scholarship so that we can, you know, like things have beginnings and ends and can actually get out there into the world at, in a reasonable amount of time. Our third project, uh, and this is the one I'm most closely involved in, is a, um, is a uh, virtual reality reconstruction of the coronation mass of Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. Um, it's, um, we have uh, a musician on the team uh, who, who does medieval music, so he's re he and his ensemble have recorded the, have reconstructed and recorded the music of the mass that was uh, played or sung um, at the at the coronation. Uh, we have an architectural historian and art historian on the team who has helped us uh, do the 3D model of the cathedral, San Petronio, where it was held. Um, we obviously have a 3D modeler on the team, and so we're. This is a you know headset experience where you go and you actually are present at this uh, coronation, um, and that um, is we're working with Duke University Press to put this out as an app in the App Store, uh, but also as an open source kind of. If you have a big headset, you can do it that way. But we're we're going to publish a, a, little, a little phone version of it. Um, so. So a range of projects. We just um, initiated our design project process for our cohort B projects. As I said, they're responding to prompts um, like indigeneity. Another set of uh, are, are responding to uh, prompts. Three projects are actually responding. We're going to figure out what happens when we run three teams responding to the same prompt. What happens when they're made up of different people, but they're responding to the same thing. Uh, just as you get very different essays from students. Mm -hmm. We're expecting very different products from these three teams. They're responding to a prompt called humility and conviction. Um, how can you, and it's something uh, along the lines of, of how can you um, both be strongly committed to a set of ideas, but also put yourself in the headspace of someone else to understand their strongly held beliefs? How does that work? Um, so, uh, that's Greenhouse Studios, that's our process, that's what we're working on. We're, uh, we should have results to show in the next, um, in the next uh, months, um, but that's our experiment. Thank you very much. So we'll open it up for questions. And wine. And wine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Can you explain? I'm sorry to be so um, dense here, but the relationship of the selection of people, which you said is like the first step, yeah. and the prompt. So, with the coronation, the, the reconstruction of the coronation mass, what was the prompt? I mean, and did it just so happen that you had a musician and an architectural historian? and an art historian who could realize something. So the prompt was not, the prompt was the limits of text. Um, and we, so we had on the team, and we put together this team, a graduate student who did 3D modeling, um, a, uh, a, uh, an art historian, a, uh, a music historian, and performer. Um, and they talked through that idea, the limits of text, and they, mostly out of um, Eric Rice's, the, 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 the music professors, um, he sort of came around to this idea like, I, I've been working on reconstructing this mass, I haven't gotten very far, and it's, and I'm, I'm writing a journal article about it. Right? I'm writing a journal article about the music that was sung in this mass and it's pretty it's like unsatisfying because it's a journal, a journal article about <laughs> music you know right and, and he said and this is a problem we music historians run into a lot where like you know you're describing something that was meant to be experienced in time and so the 3d modeler said well you know we, we could th we could put people in the cathedral mm. right and the art historian said well, I'm sure there. You know, I'm sure we can dig in and find the, the plans to do the model and and around and around and around. 
it went. So the art historian's been mostly doing, so we did send a graduate student, a photography graduate student to Italy to, to take pictures of all of the artwork. One of the things the art historian has had to do is to figure out, well, what, was what of those pictures were there in 1530? Um, and how is the, we have the, we have the, the architectural plans for the cathedral today. We have, and we have, and we have plans from various moments in time. Um, and figuring out exactly what it was in 1530, it's been a big piece of work. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and we try not, we're not, we're not, it's not exact. Right, it's faith. We're trying to be faithful um, rather than rather than fully accurate. But we are trying to put people in an experience. And 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 the ultimate thesis of the work is that um, that the the coronation would have been experienced very differently by different people in the room. So one of the things we can do with virtual reality is we can put. Um, we can we can make we can put you in the position of like one of the bishops who was standing next to the pope when he put the crown on the head. Um, we can put you up in the choir. What was the experience of being a musician in the choir um, during this event? And then we're gonna one is a courtier way 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 in the back of the cathedral. What was his experience? You couldn't see anything. You could only hear. And one of the cool things with virtual reality we can do is we can. We can change the acoustics. We can, you know, we can change your, and it's and it's and we can layer it with annotations, and the annotations can be different depending on who you are in the experience. So, um, you know, it it it, it emer this emerged from this kind of unique, and just talking through like, oh, what what are the limits of text in your work? Well, the limits of text in my work are, and that that kind of caught as an idea. People people ran with it. Um, I'm just curious. I'm, I'm extremely interested in what you're saying um, it, and in this project. And I want to know more about what you're doing, how you're getting or ensuring that you're getting people from diverse perspectives to, to participate in this. What kind of work has been done to attract that? Because, of course, that's something the museum field really struggles with is not um, hiring people but attracting people enough. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, um, it's extremely hard. Uh, it's extremely hard not just because... Not just because it's hard to find people who are diverse and and who want to do something like this. It's hard because oftentimes um, people who would constitute diversity in the ways we see it. So that's race and gender, but that's also um, uh, like in terms of labor within the university. Right. Mm -hmm. Often they have less free. Those right. people have less freedom to do right. something weird, mm -hmm. right? right? So like, there are lots of kind of newly minted associate professors who are like, "Yeah, I'll do it." Like, sounds great to take a year to do something stupid. I just got tenure, right? Like, and you know, my next book, I'm, yeah, I'll peck away at it, but I'm not like rushing into it. Um, so there are a lot of those people who are are eager to do it. Um, graduate students, like, they're on our payroll, so. There you can do it, um, but those other those other categories are tougher. Um, so we do um, so we do a lot of going around campus, talking to people. Um, we do a lot of we even do and we do a lot of kind of counseling along the way um, to make sure that people are getting what they need to get out of it. That they're not like behind on their tenure clock because they're working on this and, and things like that. But it is a really, it is, it is, it is a challenge um, along all those axes of diversity to find, to find the right people. Um, one thing that we're working on for our kind of next, we're applying for another Mellon grant, one of the things we're working on um, for, for that grant um, is to see if we can put together some kind of fellowship, um, some kind of diversity mm -hmm. fellowship. Um, either at the graduate student level or at the um, or at the, the postdoc level um, to participate in this, but it is it, it's been really hard. Um, it's been really hard. Do your projects have an interlinking function at all? And if so, would you continue to develop virtual reality projects in the future? Um, they they have an interlinking uh, function in that 
Um, each of the teams has a what we call a Greenhouse Studios design technologist on the team. Um, there are two of those, soon to be three of those uh, design technologists. Those are full-time staff members within the library. Um, and we hire those people um, basically as makers. We call them design technologists because we don't really care what skills they have. Like, it really, like, and so the two people we have now, one is a um, graphic designer and kind of a multimedia artist, graphic designer, painter, bookbinder, um, and one is a, like, programmer, like, like a CS guy. Um, and they both responded to the same job ad, and those are the two people we, we sort of like, we picked the two best people out of that pool, and we said you could be anything from a studio artist to a programmer. We don't really care, because again, what the, what the, what gets built depends on the skills in the room. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a person who does 3D, then you're not gonna do a 3D project. Um, you know, if you don't have an illustrator, you're not gonna do a graphic novel. Um, so it kinda doesn't matter who's there, it just matters that the process responds to the people, um, the people in the room. So, but that said, those people are permanent staff members. And so their kind of core skills will always push the teams in at least par partly in the directions that, that they, because they're, they're the primary makers on the team. Do you think that we could use this process, design process model for teaching in some cases? Um, so a few of our, a few of the people we're working with, Clarissa Siglio, um, she's using it in her course um, this semester. Uh, the Ballard Museum of Puppetry in stores uh, is putting on a, an exhibition on um, puppet puppetry from the African diaspora. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're using that, that collection as, and that exhibition as a prompt with her, with her a, a, a mixed class of humanities students and kind of digital media students. Um, as a, they're using that as a prompt to build something, something. Um, what they're ending up building is an Omega website, which is, you know, not all that interesting, but it's, it's, but it's suitable for a semester-long project. And, and they, you know, it's not something they've used before, those students, and, and they've come up with kind of an interesting take on where to bring this, this exhibit. So it, it is possible. Um, it is possible. Tell me to say a little bit about the, the challenges and maybe some successes in the peer review process for this work. Yeah, that's going to be that's going to be hard. So none of the works that we've built so far have gone for peer review. Um, so we're gonna. This is going to be tough. Um, one of the things that we're doing is early in the design process, we're trying to um, work with a university press. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to put a university press editor on the team. Now, whether the university press editor will actually, their press will actually publish the thing or not um, is kind of up in the air. But what that person can do is provide us with guidance on how this thing may be peer reviewed. Um, so we have actually a UMass Press um, editor on a couple of on one of the new teams mm -hmm. and on one of, one of the cohort B yeah, teams yeah. and on one of the cohort A teams. Um, and we don't have a press at UConn. Right. Um, and, and the Duke people are on the Charles V team. And it looks like they're, and they would manage the peer review and they would manage the peer review in much the way they'd manage it for a, a book. I mean, they'd send mm -hmm. it out to people with expertise and give feedback yeah, yeah. and we'd revise yeah. and mm -hmm. we do, mm -hmm. do that. We're, we're trying to, one of the things we're trying to do is is fit this process into some of this, the standard processes, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that so that this can so that these products can be recognizable as scholarship in one way or another. And some of them will be more recognizable as scholarship, and others will be more recognizable as educational resources um, or whatever, or public outreach or engagement. Mm -hmm. But but we'll we're 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 conscious of that sort of throughout the process. And one of the one of the reasons to use an actual design process is we're talking about these things at each stage, right? We, we raise these kinds of issues, like of peer review, of assessment, of, of um, 
of things like you know tenure and promotion those kinds of issues we raise at each point so when we're talking to participants about the kinds of constraints that we're get, the team is going to have to operate under one of them is like job expectations like what is your supervisor going to require for you at the end of the year for merit or for um, or for promotion or for tenure or whatever it is um, so we, we, we work that into the process we're, we're trying to do it we're trying to do it a little more self-consciously than, than um, a lot of the digital <laughs> my previous digital humanities projects we just build it and you're like hope it works hope somebody likes this um, so we're trying we're trying That's great. Um, I was really struck by the, the whole process in particular the first part uh, and it took me back to those funny words that you said at the beginning of what people call different parts of the process like for example uh, I like to take work that is that is well analyzed but not understood and I like to take it with me to the bar at four o'clock, and I call it imagination time. Yeah. My wife naturally intuits something else in that. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, it's a time when I try to like figure things out. And what I thought was the most interesting, just from my perspective, on your process was that even if you didn't follow past the first few stages, the participants will come out with a really remarkable new way of thinking and conceiving of, of not just collaboration but their own their own abilities and 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 where they want to go with them and i wonder if the just the first two steps couldn't be a really valuable model for a lot of places we've run we so interesting that you say that we've run those first two steps as a workshop a couple of times um as a sort of standalone and it's condensed as a kind of four hour five hour afternoon workshop i just did one at national council on public history um in las vegas last week um uh yeah and we do and we, we we get a group of people and we run them through this process the group comes up with an idea for a project but what the participants actually get out of it they're never going to do that project because they're never going to see each other they're at a conference. Um, but what the group gets out of it is a set of reflections on their own work. Um, and when we've done kind of post-workshop assessment, that's, that's exactly what's come out. That like, oh, this gives me a different way to think about what I'm doing and how I work with my collaborators. And, and, and right, and imagination time for structuring a different set of, like, oh, I actually, when you make people sit down and list all the things they're good at, inside and outside of work, so that's another thing we do is we sort of say to them like like what are the things you like what what do you got right like empty your pockets what what's in your toolkit and you know and, and people start they say well you know actually I know a lot about gardening and actually I know you know I, I'm a good baker or you know whatever it is um, you know I'm, I'm the guy I'm the guy who can get Uncle Joe and Uncle Bob to stop talking about politics at Thanksgiving, right? Like you start to, you know, you start to think about the things that you're good at, and and that can then feed back into like, oh, maybe I could bring some of that into this other project. All right. Well, thank you. Well, thank you guys. We're staying in the